Good morning. Welcome this morning. Glad you can be here. Those of you attending online, we are glad you can join us as well. Uh, we hope that you can visit us soon. We would love to have you. Uh, this morning, we are continuing our grounding series, so um, we are focusing on a king like no other. And uh, as spring keeps approaching, I've seen hopefully our flowers last with this warm and snow and warm and snow, but you, the rebirth of everything around us, reminding us that God had Jesus risen from the dead and there is no one like him, and there never will be anyone like him. So I invite you this morning to just open in a word of prayer with me. Dear God, we just thank you for bringing us together this morning, allowing us to praise and worship you. We're just so thankful that you sent Jesus to save us, and to just take those burdens that we have. Just ask that you be with us as we fellowship and learn more about you this morning. Amen. Let me try that again. <laughs> so... Some of us went to man camp this past weekend, and it was awesome. Uh, and during the worship sessions, one thing that they talked about was kingdom posture. And if you imagine being in the kingdom or bringing the kingdom down here with us, like how would you present yourself? If we were worshiping Jesus as he stood right here, he is standing right here. How would you present yourself? What would you look like? Uh... And in Matthew 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? You know, some people, they reply, some people think it's John the Baptist. Or who do people say the son of man is? And they say, some say it's the son of, uh, it's, it's John the Baptist. Some say it's Elijah. And others say maybe it's Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. God is alive. How do we present ourselves? Please stand and sing with us. How are we going to present ourselves this morning? Feel free. Put your hands up. Feel free to move. Feel free to feel it. I believe there is one salvation. One doorway that leads to life One redemption, one confession I believe in the name of Jesus Christ I believe in the crucifixion By His blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection hallelujah his life is SDV. all praise to God the Father all praise to Christ the Son all praise to the Holy Spirit our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me far beyond what Hearts imagine, ears have heard, or eyes have seen. I believe in the day is coming, he's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the Lamb who is rose, the roaring lion. God the Father, all praise to Christ. 
Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name I believe. No one No, I'll never be ashamed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away? From the one who saved my life All praise to God the Father All praise to Christ the Son All praise to the Holy Spirit Our God has overcome The King who was and is evermore will be in Jesus mighty name I believe praise him all praise to God our Father all praise to Christ the Son all praise to the Holy Spirit our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name I believe in Jesus' mighty name I believe Sent of heaven, 
Our scripture this morning it comes from two Bibles, uh, two different spots in the Bible. Uh, first, we'll be starting in Zechariah 9, um, verse 9. And the title of this is The Coming of Zion's King. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then the second passage in Psalms 118, verses 25 and 26. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, for the house of the Lord we bless you. Jason. Please pray with me this morning. Dear God, we just thank you for Jason and uh, the work he's put into the message this week. Just uh, be with him as he delivers this message. Let your let your spirit be in this place and, and just empower him to let us hear your words. Amen. Morning. It is great to be here with everyone again. 
Uh, thanks uh, to Bill Beck who filled in last week and allowed me and a few of the other guys to go to man camp last weekend. We had a wonderful time. Um, came out of it uh, not rested, uh, <laughs> but we had a great time uh, just uh, enjoying creation and some disc golf and some wonderful worship and uh, uh, just stepping into each other's lives and, and, and embracing each other a little bit deeper there. It was just a, a wonderful time. Uh, and so yeah, thanks to Bill Beck for uh, helping me create that space so I could join the, join the guys. Happy Palm Sunday. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is the day that we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus. Uh, when he walks into Jerusalem, not walks in, rides in, right? He rides into Jerusalem and there's this big celebration. Um, and uh, this is the story, the passage that we are using for this story today is out of John 12. Um, and, and what a statement-making celebration this was. Uh, and, and then what follows this celebration, the, the turn that's made in just a few days' time, the celebration is the start of the end. But we know the end isn't the end, right? The end is just the beginning of, <clears throat> of, of, of God coming and, and flipping everything upside down turning everything upside down. God opening the gates for all who would come to know and believe in Him to enter. Have you ever gone into a situation thinking one thing? Thinking this is what this is going to be. It's what it's going to look like. Maybe it's a conversation. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe uh, it's an event. Um, but then something completely different happened. Anybody? Anybody? When we were in, when Andre and I were in college, we went to Heston College. She knew I loved all things soccer, uh, and so there in, in Wichita, which isn't far from it, there was a, a professional indoor soccer team. And so um, Andrea purchased tickets to take us to this indoor soccer game, um, and she kept it as a surprise to me. And when she told me about it, I was like, "This is going to be awesome." And when we showed up, something, didn't, something was just off. We looked at the tickets. It was the right day, the right time. So we, we go in. And we go in, and um, this is the event that we ended up watching. <clears throat> we ended up watching indoor motocross, which was really cool and awesome. It's the first and only motocra motocross event I've ever been to. Um, when it's indoors, um, there's no venting, <laughs> not good venting. So like the top third of the, the, the arena was just full of exhaust and stuff because it just floated in there. But, um, and it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful memory. It's completely different than what we expected. Um, but I love that we got to experience, experience this together. And with the raise of hands, I, I know we all have experiences, maybe not quite like this, um, but we all have experiences where we went into something and we expected something to be one way, but then it was different. It happened different. And sometimes it was for the better. Sometimes it was just different. It wasn't bad. It wasn't good. It was just different. And sometimes it was for the worst. Maybe it was relationships or conversations we have an idea of how you know sometimes we expect the worst in a conversation you know we, we we play those conversations that we need to have sometimes in our head and we just play worst case scenarios anybody else with me on that one um, and then we go into it and it went really well right and sometimes we expect a conversation to go really well and then it doesn't right or, or relationships or or, or whatever but there was certainly an in, in anticipation and an expectation. In this, in this case that we're, we're looking at today, in, in Jesus uh, riding on the donkey into Jerusalem, this is the case. They thought something was happening. And actually, it really was happening, but not like they anticipated. It was very different than what they expected. So to set things up a little bit, this story out of John 12, and, and we'll, we'll jump into the Scripture and, and reading it in a bit, it comes at the beginning of the Passover week. 
The Passover is this week-long celebration that the Jews to this day still celebrate as they remember that this final plague um, that covered Egypt, right? When, when uh, the angel of death took the firstborn of every Egyptian but passed over the Israelites who put the lamb's blood, the sacrifice on the doors of uh, the, the posts of their doors. And this was the final message of power from God to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh finally let the Israelites go. And then while the Israelites, just a short time later, while they're wandering around in the wilderness, God commands them to remember this time to celebrate this event with an annual week-long celebration that they would call the Passover. And so this is where we're, we're coming into. This is this time to celebrate God's deliverance, to remember that we were once held captive, but God freed us. Now we enter Jesus. Through his three years of ministry, people began to think that maybe this could be the Messiah, right? They, they, had, they had heard him teach. They had heard him uh, talk in, in these new ways that they hadn't heard. He healed people. And so they thought that this could be the Messiah, the one who will deliver us from this oppression. They were under Roman oppression again at this time. And maybe this is going to be the person, this is the Messiah who's going to free us for the final last time. They're going to, this Messiah is going to restore us to the rightful place as God's chosen people. And one thing we notice when we read through the Gospel of John is that John writes his Gospel a little bit differently than the other Gospel stories. He writes not only to tell the story of Jesus, but to also prove the truth of who Jesus is by including all these throwbacks to the old prophecies. These, these prophecies that came from the Old Testament from 400, 700 more years earlier, he includes these in his story in the places where Jesus fulfills those prophecies. He writes to prove that Jesus really is the Christ. That Jesus is the Son of God who was sent here to save us. And this passage here is another example of this. So we're going to pick this up in John 12 is where we're going to be at. Uh, we'll have it on the screen, but I, I invite you to turn in your Bibles as well. John 12, verses 12 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on His way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet Him, shouting, Hosanna! And you notice these parts that are in quotation. These are the throwbacks that John has. This is a symbol that this is John giving a throwback to those Old Testament uh, prophecies, those Old Testament statements about the Messiah. So they took palm branches and went out to meet Him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young, young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your King is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, His disciples did not understand that, all this. Only after Jesus was glorified. This is only, John admits, we didn't understand this right away. Only after He died, He rose, He, he ascended, He's glorified, did they realize that these things that had been written about Him and that these things had been done to Him. Okay, we're going to stop here a second. There's a couple of things that are happening here that we need to take a closer look at. There's some deeper symbolism that uh, would have been understood in the context of, of, of their time that maybe we don't understand as much. And first is the, the, the Passover, just this, this setting of the Passover. We have this celebration of, of the palm branches and these shouts of Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This celebration shouts and shouts of Hosanna. It echoes Psalm uh, 118, verses 25 to 26. 
Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless You. See, the literal meaning of what Hosanna means is save now. And we see this echoed here in verse 25. And then we also have this piece here that's also this celebration of, with the palm branches and, and the laying down of their, their robes. Some of the other uh, uh, Gospel writers say that they, they threw their robes on the ground to soften the ground. Um, but this was a celebration that uh, would have been a response to a, a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus. Now, this isn't the Judas that betrayed Jesus. We need to be, be clear about that. But this was a Jewish hero who had defeated pagan invaders and cleansed the temple in 164 B.C. So this is about 170, 180 years before Jesus is doing all of, all of his things. Um, and so, but this was a relatively, in the, in the history of the Israelites, this Judas Maccabeus and, and the, the way he defeated uh, people that were coming at them. He cleansed the temple. This is relatively fresh in their history. It's only 100, uh, 100 uh, almost 200 years before. Um, but this celebration uh, of Judas Maccabeus, it's held in, in the winter, um, and the Jews call it Hanukkah. Okay? That might be a familiar term for us. So Hanukkah is this celebration of this time when Judas Maccabeus delivered uh, Israel, uh, kind of a Messiah-type thing, right? He delivered them from the oppression that they were on. Um, and Hanukkah is the celebration of, of Judas Maccabeus and his family becoming the kings of Israel. So this is, there's another echo then. So that's, that's, uh, those are the two things. The Passover celebration is in the spring, uh, this Hanukkah celebration is in the winter, but they're happening at the same time. We have another echo to the prophecies that John includes here uh, in his... Uh, this is a quotation from Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt, on a foal of a donkey. One thing that's uh, interesting to note is that Jesus didn't need to ride anything, right? Throughout the course of his history, he walked. He wasn't walking that far that day from Bethany to Jerusalem. It's not that far of a walk. He wouldn't have needed to ride. So why ride? Makes a statement, doesn't it? It makes a statement that was made when this Judas Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem on his celebration day. But Jesus does it on a donkey. Not this magnificent horse. And we, I don't know that we know what Judas Maccabeus rode in on. But there were many other kings when they would come into a city, they would be riding, there would be this celebration, and they would be riding majestic, beautiful Massive horses. But Jesus rides on a donkey. A sign that His kingship would be different. A sign that His kingship would look different. That this was the time that they had all been waiting for. The Messiah is here. The King is here. All is going to be made right. And uh, if you've ever wondered why Caesar referred to Jesus as the King of the Jews, it comes back to this event. It's because of this event that we're looking today. There was a sign posted on his cross, King of the Jews. He had this event that looked like other kings coming into town. The Jews themselves celebrated this fact. So we have two things going on here. We have this spring celebration and we have the symbol of Passover when God delivered them. We have this kingship celebration that was used to usher in a new king. N.T. Wright uh, compares it to, to these symbols that we have today. What do we think of when we see this? 
Christmas, right? If we see this, we know Christmas is happening. This is the symbol of like Passover for them. They knew what was going on when these Passover celebrations and events took place. Okay, what about this? Easter. I, I get the bunny or I, I get the eggs and the, the new life, you know, I get that, but the bunny, I still can't figure that one out. <laughs> Maybe you guys can enlighten me later with why the bunny's there. But so if you, uh, so what, what uh, uh, N.T. Wright is saying, you combine these two. It doesn't, they don't, it doesn't look right, right? If you have somebody eating chocolate Easter eggs or hunting for Easter eggs under a Christmas tree, you know, we would say that, that it's not quite right. They're two distinct symbols, but they don't make sense. But if these two really came together and were really celebrated together, it would be something that we would pay attention to, right? It would be a statement that something new is happening here. And so that's what was going on. So N.T. Wright says that combining this Passover celebration along with the, the, the symbolism of the Hanukkah celebration of waving palm branches in, or, in honor of someone new, shouting Hosanna, it was this startling combination that on some levels the two didn't make sense together, and on another level it was this wake-up call, something big was happening. And we know something big was happening, right? N.T. Wright says, says this about this uh, combination. They were saying that both that Jesus was the true King, come to claim His throne, and that this was the moment when God would set Israel free once and for all. This was a major statement being made. Let's jump into verses 17 to 19. We'll pause for just a bit after, after verse 18. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. And many people came because they had heard that he had performed this sign. And they went out to meet him. So here we see why this crowd is coming to meet Jesus. The first century historian, historian Josephus wrote that there could have been a, about 2.7 million Jews that would come to Jerusalem for the Passover. So there was this massive uh, influx of, of, of people coming to Jerusalem for this time. And Jesus had been around over the previous three years, right? He had been around all these different towns, walking from town to town, talking, preaching, healing, right? And, and so, uh, not only did He teach with an authority and a clarity and understanding of the Scriptures that people had never heard, we hear that throughout Scripture. Anytime He preaches or, or talks, He leaves the people in awe because they've never heard this kind of authority before. But not only did, that, did He do that, He also healed people from their diseases. He chased demons out of tortured souls. But can he also raise people from the dead? Wow. And we hear just a few days before is when this Lazarus story happens. And the people that were there and witnessed it, they're spreading the news. This man, not only, we, we hear stories of him raising people from the dead like shortly after they died, right? But this is like three or four days later. Like this guy was dead, dead. <laughs> there was no doubt about it. Jesus raised people from the dead. This must be the Messiah. And this is what drew the crowds out to meet Him, to celebrate Him, to raise, raise those palm branches, to lay their coats on the floor so that the donkey can walk on it. The Pharisees were also noticing. Go to verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after Him. How often do we read that the Pharisees and other religious leaders, after they leave an encounter with Jesus, what do they say? 
What do they plan? We have to find a way to kill him, right? And this is, you can kind of hear this last straw being broken. These people are falling for it. They're nuts. We've got to take care of him, and we've got to take care of him now. They couldn't see Jesus for who he was. And so many of us, so many have gone before us knowing about Jesus, knowing about God. But what they know, but using what they know in unhelpful ways, and using Jesus to evoke pain in others. In the same way, this is how the Pharisees viewed their role as leaders of the Jewish nation. They knew about God. But did they know the heart of God? They knew about God, but they couldn't see God right in front of them. And I don't blame them. You know, it's highly likely if, 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 if I were uh, growing up or if I were a church leader in this time, I might have had the same struggle. But my goodness, do I hope that I would have been able to open my eyes to see Him for who He is. And thank God that we have evidence and the truths to be able to look back and know that the Messiah has come and His name is Jesus. This leaves us with a choice. We can watch from afar We can use Jesus for our benefit. Or we can step in. We can accept what would come over the course of the next week of this story. You know, next week we celebrate Easter. But we don't get to Easter without Jesus being arrested. This crowd turns real fast. We don't get to Easter without Jesus being put through an unethical, paid-off trial with made-up testimonies to make Him look bad. Without Him being beaten. Without Him being traded for a murderer. And then hung on a cross to die. Then we have Easter. He's risen. And we don't have to wait till Easter to celebrate this, do we? This is something we we should be celebrating all year. Something we should be celebrating every day. This is the thing that brings this all the way around to the the finalization of the Old Covenant. You know, Old Testament uh, Testament came from the word covenant. But the the early church people that, that... put together the Bible, they didn't necessarily want it to sound like the Old Covenant was closed, so they used Testament. But we have the Old Covenant, and Jesus finalized that, and now we live in the New Covenant. And this is the thing that brings this New Covenant to life. This New Covenant is what enables us to be part of God's kingdom. What enables us to have the very nature of God Himself living inside of us. Isn't that amazing? See, without the new covenant, unless we're ethnically Jewish, we're not allowed in. But because of Jesus Christ, we are saved. And when we're saved, we live our lives with the nature of God leading the way. It's His nature that comes in and takes over. Last week I read a a book by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. And in it, he says this. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. See, we have a choice. 
We can live by God's will. Or God's going to say us, you can live by your will, that's fine. That's your choice. Look at the next sentence. All that are in hell, choose it. We have a choice which will we're going to follow. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. God gives us free choice. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, it is open. If we seek the will of God, if we seek joy, we will find it. This is Palm Sunday. This is a celebration. But it pales in comparison to Easter. And I'm trying not to get ahead, but I also can't really help it because Easter is what makes all of this come together. See, without Easter, not many would know the story of Jesus. He would just be another great historical figure like Judas Maccabeus. There might have been a few of us here that knew of Judas Maccabeus this morning. But for many of us, this might have been our first time hearing about this guy. Without Easter, Jesus falls into that same category. But back to the C.S. Lewis quote, we have a choice. We can choose Jesus. We can choose to follow the will of God. And when we seek to know the will of God, to know the nature of Jesus Christ living in us, we will find all that we could ever look for. We will find more than we could ever need. Or we can be like the Pharisees. We have a choice. We can know what we know, and we might know a lot. And we can use it to separate, to target the people who are on the outside looking in. Praise team, you can come forward. My prayer is that we will choose this first option. That we will lean into His will and that we will let Him lead us to the people who need to see Jesus in us. That we will let Him lead you to the people who need to see Jesus in you. This is an amazing story and it's not a fairy tale. This is the story that brings life. Easter is coming. So I invite you to gather up your people that don't know Him. We all know people that don't know Jesus, right? Get them this message. Jesus has saved you. He wants you to be one of His family. Are we telling the story of Jesus that opens the door and invites others in? Or are we telling a story that says you're not welcome? When we live in the will of God with Jesus at the center in the nature of who He transforms us to be, we tell the story of a God who became the very nature of a human. No other God left His kingdom on high to come to this earth to save His people. He died on the cross to save not just a certain group of people, but all of humanity. This includes you and me. Can we get an amen? We must be sending this message. And we must be inviting all who would believe to come into this family of God. Jesus has saved you. Jesus has saved me. And He wants all of us to be one of His family. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us as we close in song.
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. This is, <laughs> what else is there to say, right? This is the story of our Messiah, the story of the Christ, the King, the God who came down to live among us, who defeated all the temptations, who defeated all of sin when he died on the cross. And he created a way for us to live with the very nature of God, living 
within us. There's no other religion, there's no other God that can give us this gift. There's only one. There's so many people who don't know this truth. And it's not just a truth to throw around and throw in people's faces, but it's a truth of this grace of this God who sacrificed himself. We have this gift to share. There's so many people who need to come and know him, and I know you. (laughs) You all have Jesus in you. So my prayer is that, God, may we have the courage and the compassion to see the people around us through your eyes, through your grace, through your love, through your mercy. God, as we view the people around us, whether it's just somebody out in our community or, or people that we know deeply, God, I pray that we can share you with them. God, this next week is a reminder of the, the, the journey that you went through, and it was tough and painful. And, and we don't even like, we don't like to think about it. When we watch and play this out in our minds, it's so hard to imagine what you went through. But we, God, we thank you that Easter's coming. We thank you that not only did you die in our place, you forgave us our sins for all of eternity, but you defeated death. Death doesn't hold us captive. It's not something to be scared of. Because when death comes our way to our human bodies, we have an eternity with you. God, give us the words, give us the hope to share this story. God, we thank you that Easter's coming. Amen. You may be seated.